Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, Peter Carr. I'm one of the hosts. And um, so today we're uh, very pleased to have um, Steve Heston as our speaker. Uh, Steve is very well known in the uh, in the finance community uh, for many different contributions. And um, he's um, graduated with uh, a Bachelor of Science double major in math and economics from the University of Maryland College Park in 1983, um, where he actually um, is a professor now. So he attended the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, earned an MBA in 1985, followed by a PhD in finance in 1990. He's held previous faculty positions at Yale, Columbia, Washington University, and the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He worked in the private sector with Goldman Sachs in fixed income arbitrage and in asset management quantitative equities. He's known for analyzing options with stochastic volatility and international stock risk as an understatement. <laughs> okay, so um, just before I uh, turn the mic over to Steve, I just wanted to mention that we have a couple of um, virtual talks coming up soon. So next week on April 23rd, at this time, we'll have um, Professor Agostino Caponi from Columbia University. And a week after that, we'll have uh, Professor Igor Chilenko from the Illinois Institute of Technology. And um, I believe uh, we have a speaker also May 7th. Um, it's Federico Bondi from uh, Johns Hopkins University. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to uh, turn over the floor to uh, Professor Stephen Heston. Steve, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Peter. And thank you everyone for logging in. Uh, while I participated in Zoom, this is the first time I've given a Zoom talk. So um, if internet goes out or I get bumped off, I'll log back on and try to answer any of your questions. Yeah, regarding that, I mean, I think, oh, there's 36 participants, wow. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, for now, we'll just make it that you unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, if it gets too hectic, we'll go to uh, raising hands mode. Okay, all right. Let's okay, go I'll rely on your duties and expertise as moderator, Peter. Okay. And, uh, you can interrupt me if I'm going too fast or if you see a question that I don't. Okay. So, so the title is Recovering the Variance Premium. And this clearly goes to uh, Ross recovery and subsequent work. And this was a, uh, a research program to recover physical or observable probabilities from options prices. All right. <clears throat> The, the basic logic was that Ross assumed a stationary state space. And the intuition in the paper was uh, uncharacteristically poor. Uh, he used uh, the Perron-Frobenius theorem to derive the pricing kernel. And you think, OK, fine. What, what's the economics of the uh, Perron-Frobenius theorem? <clears throat> and the answer is, it assumes time-separable preferences. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, that's, that's the important part. <clears throat> if if preference are, preferences are separable across time, in other words, we have expected utility uh, and your lifetime utility is your utility tomorrow, you know, discounted plus your utility today, um, then you would get a transition independent pricing kernel. So this is very common in a lot of models we have. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's not the only arbitrage-free pricing kernel. In principle, you could have all sorts of non-separability between uh, consumption today and consumption in the future. Or you could have a path-dependent pricing kernel that incorporates habit persistence or all sorts of intertemporal non-linearities. But Ross says, well, we kind of believe in additive expected utility or for pricing, marginal utility, and that's why we're going to assume um, a um, uh, yeah, man. independent kernel. I'm sorry, that sounded like a computer. Uh, can you restate the question, please? Yeah, Steve, I'm thinking someone mistakenly had their mic on. And oh, all saying. right, that's fine. And okay. that's just the technology. Yeah. Okay, so Ross set up this framework. And uh, he said, I want to recover testable implications. In particular, I want to be able to recover the true probabilities from options, which I think a lot of us have wanted to do for a long time. And the assumption he made was inspired by um, time-separable 
expected utility, and it's called a transition independent pricing kernel. Right. The limitations of this are that it can't even accommodate the binomial model or Black Scholes, and I'm darn sure that Ross was familiar with the Cox Ross Rubinstein model. Mm -hmm. So you think, wait a minute, how can you possibly apply the stationary model to the S&P 500? Yeah, just, just to clarify, Steve, um, I want to say that like Black Scholes, you know, I would say does have a transition independent pricing kernel, but is violating other assumptions that Ross yes. made that let that caused one to not be able to recover in that context. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Carr and you did work, or <laughs> Carr and his co-author named you. Um, <laughs> did, did Very work. funny. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, looking at um, unbounded processes, uh, but our, our Ross recovered. <clears throat> he depended heavily on the stationarity as well as um, what he called transition independence. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> uh, the problem is that we know that you can't recover the mean stock return in the Black-Scholes model. So even in the sort of nicest, most natural option model, uh, the Ross recovery is impossible, just fundamentally. And we're going to have to relax things or be slightly ambitious if we want to make headway. Okay, so that's one criticism. <clears throat> And these criticisms are, are fine because um, they'll show us how to fix the problem. But the second uh, criticism is that Ross recovery relied on interest rate variation. And if you assume that interest rates are constant in uh, the Ross framework, then he recovers risk neutrality. And that's kind of boring and not true because uh, right, some assets like the stock market earn higher average return than other assets like the bond market. So what the Ross uh, framework does is it predicts that the long bond is log efficient. And that is the sum total of its empirical predictions. And you know that's also, also false because there are a lot of portfolios that on average outperform the long bond. Can you just tell us what it means, the, what the yeah. long bond means and what log efficient means? What, what this means that is that a an investor with log utility will find the long bond to be the optimal portfolio to invest in. Um, and what is that long bond? <laughs> a long bond, yes, this would be an asymptotically long zero coupon bond. So if you took okay. treasury strips, and you could take a five year strip or a 10 year strip that just pays off a zero coupon bullet at year five or 10, and then extend that out to year 20 and 30 and out to infinity and hold on to that for one period with my data one month, <clears throat> but if you hold on to that for one period, that in a sense has the highest mean uh, for its log or which is approximately its variance. Okay. So this is in some sense, the best portfolio to invest in is a very, very long um, forward contract on risk-free cash flows. <clears throat> and all I'll say is it's false because there are um, <laughs> portfolios that do better than uh, long-term treasury bonds. Steve, can I, this is Leon, can I ask a question, a simple question, is log efficient. So you mean for a fixed horizon date, if my utility is um, logarithmic, then for any kind of unwinder horizon date, that infinite maturity zero coupon bond has the highest expected return? Is that what you're saying? Um. Well, of course, the expected return doesn't depend on your utility, but your utility wants to manage risk. And if you're a if you have log utility, there's some portfolios that are too risky. And right? yeah, I mean, I, well, yeah, what I meant was, I guess, the one that maximizes utility. Then is what I'm yeah. saying. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. I said that wrong. This yes. says that if you buy a long-term bond, like a hundred-year bond, and then you sell it when it's only a 99-year bond, and keep rolling over that position, that that will give you the highest expected utility. Right. <clears throat> And that is, the, uh, that, that is the total prediction from the Ross model. Why did you have the selling at the 99 year point, Steve? Well, because if you hold a long bond for 99 years, a 100 year bond for 99 years, it's no longer a long bond. It's a short bond. So you need to maintain an asymptotically long maturity. 
So is the statement that, um, let's say first for finite horizon, you have log utility and let's say we're not gonna make a statement about what's optimal at finite horizon, but as we now send the horizon to infinity, then what you should hold if you're a log utility investor is a bond of that infinite horizon. Right, right. well, let me okay. emphasize that your utility function is a function of your consumption in one period, let's say one year. Oh, okay. But, you're but of course you can buy a long-term bond and sell it after one year. You can mm -hmm. buy a five-year or 10-year bond sell it after one year and then buy another one. <clears throat> and this says that the optimal investment will be buying a very, very long-term bond and selling it after one year and then rebalancing to maintain a very long-term bond. Okay, thanks. All right, let's move on. Right. So log efficiency is not that different from mean variance efficiency, right? Mean variance efficiency gets the highest mean subject to a constraint on the variance or the second moment and log utility or the log efficiency gets the highest mean subject to a constraint on the expected logarithm of the payoff. Okay. And um, so my first point here empirical is that this is false. There are a lot of um, strategies, dynamic strategies, for example, that outperform long-term treasury bonds. And the Ibbotson and, and Singefeld data or the updated Ibbotson data show that the term premium uh, right, the expected return on long-term treasury bonds is around 1% per year. Uh, that's not very good. <clears throat> so, but then the third point I have is theoretical, the last one on my slide here. And that is that it's really arbitrary because Ross effectively assumes that the long-term US dollar bond is the best thing to invest in. Right, he, he works with dollar returns. <clears throat> and then you go over and have Ian Martin in London, and Ian Martin assumes that the US dollar is the way to measure returns. And I think, wait a minute, shouldn't Ian be using the British pound or the euro? <clears throat> Indeed, why not use some other numeraire like the money market? But the problem is that if you use uh, a numeraire like the money market with constant interest rates, then the Ross, uh, recovers risk neutrality. So my theoretical point is that the predictions of the theory depend on your numeraire, your currency. And if you're risk neutral in one numeraire, you're probably not risk neutral in another numeraire. Right, there's the Siegel paradox. So there's a, an inherent ambiguity in the theory, and we're going to have to take a stand on what the appropriate numeraire is and that's okay, I'm going to fix this problem, but it, it's a clear problem. And maybe if I fix the numeraire, I will also have better predictions. Okay, so let me pause here for questions in case people aren't familiar with the Ross recovery theory or some of this terminology. Well, I think it's fair to say, you know, not everybody's familiar with this Ross recovery theorem, um, but some people are. And, okay. uh, you know, so, um, but anyway, um, I think you did a good job motivating it, uh, that he's trying to, as you said, recover, you know. The, like, so this paper, crisis, yeah. then I'm gonna proceed. And this paper is, um, oh, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do, and I'll start the, the basic example. Instead of assuming um, a stationary economy, I'm going to assume stationary growth. So if you look at models like the Black-Scholes model, um, the Black-Scholes model doesn't have a stationary stock price. Instead, it has IID stock returns. And you can look at Mayra Prescott or Cox Ingersoll and Ross. A lot of models have stationary growth rates. Yeah. So, Right, I've seen the Dow Jones go from the thousands to above 20,000, right? The economy grows over time. <clears throat> and um, uh, that just won't fit into the Ross paradigm. The result, so I'm going to assume something I call um, path independence. And you might wonder where that comes from. And the answer is um, it comes from something like Epstein Zinn recursive preferences, or it comes from separable power utility. So I could say that 
that um, utility is separable as Ross did, um, right? <clears throat> so that um, the marginal rate of substitution is just your marginal utility tomorrow divided by your marginal utility today. I can actually be slightly more general and use Kreps, Porteous Kreps or uh, Epstein's in recursive preferences, which involve power utility um, in a complicated way. <clears throat> So this is the intuitively the inspiration for the assumption that I'm going to make, and it's a strict generalization of the Ross assumption. So I'm, I'm enlarging the assumption about stationarity to make it stationary with growth. Uh, if you have zero growth, then it's the same thing. And uh, I'm using a similar um, assumption, but it's inspired not just by expected utility, time separable discounted utility, but by more general recursive preferences. I didn't understand, Steve, the statement that zero growth is the same thing as uh, stationarity and levels, I guess, which is what <clears throat> Ross had. Well, um, let's see. Um, I'm going to assume a functional form on the pricing kernel, and that functional form is going to nest uh, Ross's time separable. Uh, inspiration. Okay. So I'm going to have a parameter called the risk aversion parameter gamma. And when that parameter is zero, it's the same as a uh, Ross. When it's non-zero, it's different. Okay. Okay. And, but the, the inspiration behind it is a stationary growth economy where this parameter will be natural. Okay. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to give a prediction that a particular option portfolio, an asymptotic uh, power security is log efficient. So instead of saying that a bond, a long-term bond that pays out one US dollar is log efficient, I'm going to show you a different numeraire. You could say maybe a bond should pay out one euro, or you might say it pays out one share of the S&P 500. Instead, I'm going to show you that this numeraire should pay out the S&P 500 to some power. So th this is going to be the, the result I have. Uh, this is a model-free uh, portfolio that in principle could be synthesized from long-term options. And if you call this the numeraire, then uh, this is a non-stationary numeraire and um, Ross recovery is equivalent to, or my framework is equivalent to Ross recovery in this different non-stationary numeraire. So to sum up the last two slides, <clears throat> Ross relies on US dollars, which seems arbitrary and has some um, bad empirical predictions. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce a different numeraire, which is also arbitrary, but it has good empirical predictions and it actually emerges naturally from models that we are familiar with. Yeah, is the type of non-stationarity that the power security has of the form that um, the value of this power security does depend on time, but only as an exponential function of time, like with a constant in front of the T time. Uh, well, exactly. well, we're going to use returns on this security. Uh -huh. So in the long bond example, right, you can buy a hundred year bond and sell it after one year when it's a 99 year bond. And realistically, the risk and return of a hundred year bond and 99 year bond are pretty darn similar. So I'm going to consider buying 100-year options and selling them one year later. Okay. The uh, options speaking. create a power payoff. Yes. And um, the value of those of that portfolio of options has the form function of state variables times e to the constant times t. Is that true? Um, let me think. The uh, It's going to have some exponential properties as time recedes. Um, some transform of it has to get stationary or exponential, if you will. Let, let me wait until I actually okay. get to the formula for it, and then okay. we can have a discussion because I'm not even sure myself. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so I've got this really general theory, and so did Ross. And <laughs> the problem when we're trying to learn about theories is having no examples. We have this completely general framework and, you know, just give me one good example and then I'll understand what's going on. Right. So I'm going to give you one. Okay. And this is pretty much the simplest example we can have. <clears throat> it's uh, based on my 1993 
stochastic volatility model where we have the, the first equation one, ds equals rs dt plus the square root of s dz. So that looks like the Black-Scholes model, but then I'm letting this, the volatility, or the, rather the variance, v, be a square root process, which is a non-negative process, which has its own innovation, dz2. And these are both in the risk-neutral measure, so in principle, they can all be extracted from option prices. All right. Uh, I want to distinguish the, the risk neutral measure from the physical dynamics, which are in equation two, which look exactly the same, except there are different parameters. There's an equity premium, premium parameter mu, and there's a different, um, different variance dynamics, which involves a variance pre parameter, uh, which my 93 paper called lambda. But let me just say that the physical dynamics and the risk neutral dynamics are different. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we would like to uniquely or almost uniquely figure out what the uh, physical dynamics are. And that means we have to figure out what the pricing kernel is. Since the, um, the difference between the physical probabilities and the risk neutral probabilities is the pricing kernel. And that has a martingale condition, who I call the pricing kernel M. You can think of it as a marginal utility or martingale because m is a ran m times the uh, times the payoff u is a random walk. So if you get one util of consumption today and you invest in the security u, then you your expected utils of consumption will be one in the future. Do you assume that the Brownian motions have the same correlation under the risk neutral and the physical dynamics? Yes. So the quadratic variation, which means variances and covariances in continuous time, are very accurately observable in a diffusion. If you use small enough time interval and you cut the time interval up into lots of pieces, then you can measure betas and variances and covariances as accurately as desired. So the correlations will be the same in the risk neutral and physical measures, but the drifts might be different. And that's why I have this mu for an equity premium, and that's why the kappa and theta, the mean reversion and level of variance in the physical measure might be different from the risk neutral measure. Okay, do you understand? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. All right, going on, Stefan. Uh, I'm still learning this uh, software. <clears throat> so this model has, um, oh, this model has two uh, risk premiums. There's an equity premium mu, and there's a variance premium parameter that connects uh, the mean reversion in the physical measure to the mean reversion in the risk neutral measure. So we can just call it kappa star minus kappa. So there are two different risk premia in this model. You also have like theta and theta star different from each other on the last slide. Yes, that, that's true. There will be a relationship between them also. And uh, the original paper had only one parameter governing uh, this, but still there are two risk premia in this model. There's an equity premium and a variance premium at a minimum because there are two DZs. And um, so we need uh, to find a risk or I should say a return premium for each DZ. Is it, I just want to understand how you're thinking about these two risk premium. Are they constants or are they stochastic processes or what? Well, right now I'm not saying what they are, but uh, yeah. they may or may not be constant. In fact, in my 93 paper, I assume they were both proportional to the variance. Okay. And then this slide just says in my 93 paper, if you, if you just take my previous slide, there is a, a unique pricing kernel and it has the exponential affine form. It's the stock price to a power with a constant time discount rate, um, an exponential function of variance V and this exponential integral term. So if you're fans of Gersonov's theorem, they call this something like an exponential super martingale and yeah. messy. So earlier when I was talking about, you know, the power, the value of a portfolio of options that pays a power at the stock price. Um, yes. I was actually thinking about this right-hand side. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you look at the form of the right-hand side, the form of the right-hand side is 
you have, um, let's say, a function of three state variables, namely s, the integral of v, and v, and then times e to the delta t. Okay, that's the form of the right-hand side. Yes. And um, let's say the way t is entering is merely through e to the delta t. And earlier you were saying that the value of a portfolio of options was non-stationary. <laughs> and I was asking, uh, is the non-stationary merely of the form? Uh, e well, it, it is going to be similar. It's, let me just see how many slides down it is. It's, okay. um, it's around four slides down. All right, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. I, I think you have the slides. <clears throat> but, um, Steve, can I ask a question? This is Leon. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry to interrupt. And sure Stefan's question. Is it, is it obvious? I should have it. It's true that if this is the kernel for the change of measure, then that will imply that the correlation between the two brown emotions will not change when you change measure. Am I correct to say that? That with um, this choice of well, M? Well, it's, what you say is correct, but it's true much more generally because if the correlations are different in the risk neutral and the physical measure, there is an arbitrage. Right? Because you can measure the correlation essentially perfectly. And so you, if you know that the correlation is negative 75%, you bet somebody it will be negative 75%. And if they'll pay you positive money, that's free money because uh, you know, you're guaranteed uh, to, uh, to observe it. All right. In fact, uh, Peter Carr's work with Roger Lee shows how to um, create option portfolios that pay off the instantaneous variance or the integral of variance. All right. So what I've done now is not particularly new, but we need to lay the framework that I have uh, I said, here's the physical probabilities, here's the risk neutral probabilities, and this M thing is the ratio. I had the urge to point to it on my screen, but I used <laughs> the cursor instead. Use the cursor, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you're seeing your cursor, yeah. It's yeah. like a hand. So, um, Okay, so there's not a lot new. You, if I assume an exponential affine form, well, that turns out to be the M in this model. So let me talk about Merton. <clears throat> Merton made a bucket shop assumption saying that he believed that this, this U security, you know, say a call option, is a function of the stock price, variance, and time. And actually, in the Black-Scholes-Merton model, variance was constant. But I modestly generalized the bucket assumption uh, bucket shop assumption. I said, hey, the option is a function of the stock price variance and time. Nobody batted an eye. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Well, now I want to say that the pricing kernel is a function of the stock price variance and time. This is a modest generalization. I hope modest. <clears throat> In other words, I don't want M to depend on the integral of variance. I don't, so let me flip previously to what M looks like. There. M is the stock price to a power. All right, time is fine. M depends not only on the terminal variance, the no, variance no. Of, I mean, but on the path of variance. So it depends not only on where you are, but how you got there. <clears throat> I want to say it doesn't depend on how you got there. It doesn't depend on the integral of variance. It doesn't depend on what variance was last week or last month. It just depends on the variance today. So by looking at this one simple example, I'm inspired to place a condition which is much more general than this model, because in this model, we actually know what the functional form is. to say that M is a function only of the variance today. Now, yeah, so is this the sense in which you, you get to, like, let's say, compare yourself with Ross, because he has like the so-called transition independent kernel, and you are also looking for transition independence in this M. Yes, well, I, I actually published in 2004 and called it path independence. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so fine. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I mean, um, I, I guess. Is, let, let me just show you what the functional, I'm assuming that M is a function of V times the stock price to a power, whereas Ross assumed that it was just a function of the state space. In this case, that's V. So I'm assuming you can identify a portfolio such as the S&P 500, and you believe that the pricing kernel is a homogeneous function of the S&P 500 multiplied by an arbitrary function of the state space vector V. So that's what you did in 2004, you're saying? 
Uh, well, 2004, I didn't even have a V. I just said it should, we should use power utility. <clears throat> right. And there's been a lot of options papers written using power utility. And you say, well, why is power utility so special? Um, well, because that makes the marginal rate of substitution across two future dates not depend on intermediate dates. It depends only on the future and on the current time, but not on times in between. Okay. So, so um, what I'm saying is that <clears throat> in terms of why you should trust me for this functional form, um, the power part is pretty obvious because we think that returns should be independent of the stock price level in both the physical and the risk neutral measure. So we think options should be a function of moneyness and we think that the return on the um, S&P 500 or on the Dow doesn't depend on whether the Dow is 20,000 or 10,000 or 1,000. Yeah. So practitioners would call this sticky delta, <laughs> just in case okay. you care. Sticky All right. Delta. Yeah. Yeah, so the delta should be sticky and the, um, yeah, I say yeah. that the options should be homogeneous in the stock price and the present value of the strike price and that returns should not depend on the level. So sticky delta, as you will. Now, if you, you have to make some assumption if you want to uh, use anything besides absence of arbitrage. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, also, it's natural to, if I'm the economist and it's my darn model, you say, okay, it's a big assumption, but we'll assume that options depend on variance. I say, okay, well, if you'll tolerate that assumption, I want you to say that the pricing kernel depends on variance. And it doesn't depend on variables that aren't in the model. So I don't have a second volatility factor or a third volatility factor or a separate jump factor. <clears throat> and I also don't have the history of the variance, the lag variance. And in principle, I could have a two and three factor model. And many of us have had the, such models. Uh, but uh, th so this is a principle of parsimony and this gets back to what Leon asked about the correlation, that we're actually pretty good at measuring variances and covariances, and we're pretty bad at measuring means in finance. Right? This is just a property of the data. <clears throat> and you might come up with a really complicated path-dependent pricing kernel, but it's hard to estimate, just econometrically. Right? We, we're bad at estimating means from a short time series. So if you came up with a path-dependent uh, pricing kernel, I could probably come up with a function of V that has the same covariance with everything observable, but a somewhat different drift because you know, it, it's path-independent. It's just a function of the current V. <clears throat> so we're not going to have a lot of power to distinguish different Vs, and that's why I'm choosing a simple class. Uh, and I'm saying that the marginal utility function H depends only on V, not on the path of V. So this is the analog of Ross's assumption, but basically I'm doing, making the same assumption as Ross, but I'm multiplying everything by the stock price to a power gamma, where gamma is like relative risk aversion. Yeah, so in other words, you're sort of thinking, okay, what Ross actually did is that a single state variable, which he called X, <laughs> and you're thinking that um, he was choosing V, your V, <laughs> as X, and um, you know he had a, a finite state Markov chain, you clearly have, you probably have in mind uh, a, diff a particular diffusion process, what people often well, call it. Well, my V could be a much okay. higher dimensional vector, but it, you know, I chose a square root process because everything's solvable. So V That's is fine. a Markov chain, but in addition, I'm multiplying by the stock price to a power because I want some homogeneity or sticky delta in my stock price movements. Yeah. So let's say you have a two-factor continuous time, um, you know, bivariate diffusion process, right? <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do want to state that um, V need not be one-dimensional. It need not be a diffusion. Yeah. The, the, this, the concept is quite general, but I want to have simple closed-form solutions and, um, and implement it. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to go through the math quickly because the paper's available, and if you appreciate the math, great. If you don't, um, I'll tell you what it means. <clears throat> I, 
we can take the martingale condition earlier and ex and uh, I'm going to use the reciprocal of the marginal utility function H. I call it N. So Peter before said N is kind of like a numerator because the reciprocal of marginal utility is uh, roughly speaking a martingale, at least if gamma equals zero. <clears throat> but I'm going to express things instead of this, in terms of this H function, I'm going to express in terms of this, the reciprocal N. Mm -hmm. The martingale gives us condition, gives us this, um, uh, part of this ordinary differential equation. That's linear. <laughs> yeah, linear ordinary differential equation, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, a little theorem is that if the marginal utility H is non-negative, then its reciprocal will also be non-negative. So uh, <clears throat> we want part positive marginal utility. And it turns out for a given gamma, for a given risk aversion, there is a unique solution n to this ordinary differential equation that is positive. Yeah, and let's say, <laughs> I guess you're using the letter n because you're thinking it's the value of a numerator. Is that true? Sort of. I'm, okay, because <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, so, all right, because it is, yeah. So like John uh, Long would call it the numerator portfolio value. Yes, yes, very much like John Long's numerator portfolio. Right, okay, go ahead. So. Um, it, it, for a given risk aversion, there is a unique solution here. And guess what that solution is? It's the same solution I showed you earlier. Uh, let me just jump up here. There it is. It's the same solution here with eta equal to zero. So it's the path independent solution. But I haven't assumed that the physical dynamics have any form. I've assumed only the risk neutral dynamics and path independence. And then I get this M with the parameter restriction A to equal zero. And I get the physical dynamics I showed you in the beginning. Yeah, could you show us that ODE again? Yes, it involves the variance, uh, a variance involves the risk neutral drift and involves a correlation term along with the risk aversion. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, <clears throat> so subject to the one parameter gamma, the risk aversion, uh, you can think of it as the equity premium parameter. I have recovered the, the pricing kernel and consequently the physical dynamics for variance without assuming what the variance premium is. Yeah, just a small point. There's, I think there's a missing bracket on your bottom equation. Um, so what's multiplying n, um, yes, there's a, there. I see a, there's a missing bracket, right? So that you need a left square bracket to be inserted somewhere there. Um, yes, I do. And, um, it's, yes, it's probably right after the N prime. Yeah. So starting right there. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Th <laughs> thank you. Let me just write this down. All right. Got it. <clears throat> okay. So what I've shown you that, that, the particular functional form obviously depends on the square root process, but we get, <clears throat> you get it, a unique equation and we recover the physical dynamics down to one parameter. For example, even in the Black-Scholes case, we would, um, we would not be able to recover the mean unless we knew gamma. But you recover everything up to gamma. And so if you pick gamma to match the mean, you recover everything. So I would like to show you a model free result. Everything I've done so far depends on the square root process, but this result is much more general. Okay, so, so just to summarize, um, let's say your result is that if you, you know, if you assume path independence as you have, then um, you get the P dynamics of V, um, um, well, as well as if you, and if you furthermore note gamma, you also get the P dynamics of S. Is that yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah. What so if I've, like I didn't care about S at all? Is it enough? Do I, then do I need to know gamma or not? You do need to know gamma uh, if you want the equity premium. Otherwise, yeah, you're going say to have, I don't. Oh, okay. Don't, sorry. Say I don't care about the equity premium. Do I need to know gamma? Um, well, for some things, like if you wanted to know twice the equity premium or or something. <clears throat> no, what I'm if, trying to say is if all I care yeah. about is the variance risk premium, do I need to know gamma? You do because variance is correlated with the S&P 500. Okay, return. okay, thanks. All right. But if you wanted something like an option on 
Yes, for that reason, you would need to know it. If you created a security that was independent of stock price movements, then you would not need it. Yeah, okay, I'm following. Thank All right, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let me consider this power security, right? There's a partial differential equation in the risk neutral measure we use to value things. And I want my security U to pay off the stock price to a power five. And because I chose a square root process, I can actually calculate a closed form solution. And the answer is that the value of that security today is the stock price today to a power. Again, I can't point, I can only use my cursor. Yeah. <clears throat> times some exponential affine function of variance. Yeah, so now do I get to ask my question about stationary? Now, yes, now you can <laughs> ask the question. Okay, so we have non-stationarity you said earlier in this U function, but the form of the non-stationarity is merely E to the C times tiny maturity. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's true. Things are going to decay exponentially in this model at some rate. Oh, actually, um, there's more. The D, the D there is a function of tiny maturity. Is that true? That's what that means? Yes, D is a function of maturity, but okay. if you look at the forward D or the derivative of D, that's going to look exponential or, or something. Oh, yeah, so, so actually... I think I'm wrong. The C is a function of tiny maturity as opposed to it's C times tiny maturity, right? That's yes, what you mean. that is correct. But okay, okay. at very long times, I think it does look exponential for long times. Okay, okay, that clarifies everything. All right, thank you. All right. Yes, and, and we expect that the variance goes to some steady state. So again, an option on say the S&P 500 squared or on the square root of the S&P 500 at 100 years is not going to look that different from 99 years. Yeah. So the non-stationarity is there, I agree, and it's coming from, let's say, the, 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 like the, let's say the mean reverting square root form of the dynamics, like I'm sure other models would give it too, but let's say um, that, you know, like, like if I assumed, like say you assumed instead of mean reverting square root for V, say you assumed a geometric ground motion for V. Okay, there's all kinds of issues with that, but all I'm saying is then you wouldn't have this um, non-stationarity. Well, you might have a different non-stationarity or, or something. Um, no, I'm thinking you wouldn't because, you know, it's the same thing as, um, well, all right, let's say it's arithmetic, you know, this has obviously got problems, but if I said oh, you want arithmetic for variance, okay, never mind. I mean, then anyway, all right, let, let's move on, okay. Okay, so in fact, Peter, you were wondering about the functional form of D. Next slide tells you that okay. if you take a really long-term power security, D goes to a constant. Okay. Um, if you choose the right power, and that constant is in fact the variance preference parameter in the pricing kernel, which means if you choose the right, if you know gamma, so you choose the right power security, long-term option prices reveal the variance. Uh, pricing. And on the next slide, uh, <clears throat> that the return, the one period or short term return, of, or instantaneous return on a long term power security with the correct power is the reciprocal of the stochastic discount factor. In other words, this long term power security is growth optimal. Okay, so <clears throat> if we can I don't know what the power is, you know, let's say, let's suppose the power is oh, negative one. So let's suppose that the, uh, we want a security pays off the reciprocal of the S&P 500. Well, if we, we can synthesize that using the cross section of options and use really, really long term options and then returns on this will be log efficient. And if you use returns on this as the numerator, um, this predicts that, um, uh, we will be risk neutral. Okay, okay. and uh, so that's actually a model free result. It, <clears throat> when I say by this asymptotically long power security, I'm not saying that the formula for it is given in by my paper or any paper I know. I'm just saying that if you agree with my assumption about the pricing kernel, then the, uh, this long-term option portfolio will give you a high mean with low risk, and um, that can be used to value any security. OK. 
and I want to scroll down and see the blank faces or the blank screens. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, well, just to summarize, I'd say, like, I think you're saying that um, if the Q dynamics have the form you specify, then um, you're able, let's say, by looking at, by knowing gamma and by looking at long-term option prices, um, but like the, who's, you know, you form a portfolio paying the stock price raise to that gamma that you know, that um, you can learn this um, sort of eta parameter that um, fixes the, um, the risk premium on instantaneous variance. Is that right? Yes, I think it's psi. There, oh, psi. Okay, so that's what you're learning, psi. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Could you go back one slide? Yes. Uh... Psi. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay, fine. And so knowing psi, that fixes the variance risk premium, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in the square root model, you'll actually be able to see. Uh, Xi, uh, and, but in a more general model, you can still use this long-term power security as the numeraire. I don't know what the functional form will be because I don't know what the model will be, but uh, this results that um, the long-term power security is log efficient. Um, that's true in much more general models. It doesn't depend on the square root process. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> um, I want to recover something and I, I want to put this to work. So let me show you a picture of the data I'm going to use. Uh, now, option um, empirical papers tend to be complicated. They use a lot of data, which makes things a little bit opaque on top of all the math. And I only want to use the indices. So I want to use um, the VIX, or, you know, the one month um, option variance, and I want to use VIX 3M for comparison, which is the three month variance. And I plotted them here along with realized, I plotted volatility. Uh, so I plotted uh, them and you can see that the blue line realized volatility is usually below uh, the um, uh, volatility indices from options. This year is a prominent exception. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Anyway, so we know that there's a negative variance premium that uh, the option portfolios um, earn low returns. I'll show you negative returns. And I have a model that predicts returns at, uh, on options. And I want to look at returns because if I fit option data and show that um, <clears throat> the world is not a square root process, that might just be because right, I have the wrong model. But I want to try and predict returns uh, to turn this into an asset pricing paper. If we can recover physical probabilities, that means we can recover um, the pricing kernel, which means we can recover expected returns on any strategy. And I, so I have to decide what are the appropriate returns we want to explain. And here we are. Uh, <clears throat> let me remind uh, people that the VIX index is based on the price of an option portfolio. And uh, so is the VIX 3M. So the, the VIX index is based on a one month portfolio, right? technically 30 days, but I rescale it to the calendar days. And uh, the VIX 3M is based on a three month portfolio. So I have, um, I have some summary statistics here. The VIX is on average about 20% per year and VIX 3M, the three month variance or standard deviation is about 21% per year. The realized variance is a lot lower, no surprise. And these things are strongly negatively correlated, negative 75 or negative 78% with the S&P 500 return. <clears throat> so I should be able to compute returns on the VIX and the three month the VIX 3M and on the S&P 500. And I should be able to fit these things Right, the, uh, the Ross recovery, I'm, I'm not sure how you even implement it on something non-stationary like the uh, S&P 500, <clears throat> but um, 
the interest rates really don't move a lot. So the Ross theory would predict that these returns are all about the same. And uh, my theory predicts they're quite different. So let's see. Uh, <clears throat> right, I want to talk about a related empirical finding, which is called the expectations hypothesis. Uh, hey, Steve. Yes. Um, like, um, so, um, you know, I agree that, um, I don't know how I'd implement Ross for something non-stationary like S&P 500. And um, so, like, you know, when he was live, I remember telling him he should be applying it to interest rates, okay? And, because uh, at least there's some hope of stationarity there. Right. And, um, you know, and so I think you're applying it to instantaneous variance, which is sort of, let's say, consistent <laughs> with, you know, the way you, you value uh, options with stochastic volatility. It's like taking an analogy that's not obvious between interest rates and variance rates. Anyway, um, like say that um, all one wanted to do is use um, VIX options, never use S&P 500 options, and like try to infer variance risk premium only, okay? Um, so couldn't that you, one do that too, as opposed to use S&P 500 <laughs> options and model S&P 500? Well, no, the answer is that there will be a difference because you won't be able to identify the gamma parameter. Yeah, because I don't care. Like I'm, my only goal in life is to learn the variance risk premium and I couldn't care less about equity risk premium. Okay. And I don't even have S&P 500 options to look right. at, but I do have VIX options to yep. look at. If that's the case, yeah. um, then you could apply Ross recovery. Now, it, it's a good question because if you reject, what will I, what would I tell you? I'll say, well, use Ross recovery, but there was a missing state variable and that state variable is the S&P 500. Yeah, but and, you don't have the, for the variance, you know, instantaneous variance dynamics, S&P 500 is not entering, which is typical. And so it's not, you know, let's say one could, I think, you know, let's say, let's call it the, the special case of your model. Um, yes. You know, one could, as a special case of what you presented so far, just use VIX options to infer the variance risk premium and just be a little simpler is what I'm, I'm thinking. Well, I, I think I could think about it, but I will say that this parameter could have different values. And um, yeah, th this parameter could have different values. If you set gamma equal to zero, then you're done. But if gamma could be non-zero, then you could have different values for the variance premium. So, like uh, you know, so let's let's be clear. I mean, I have exactly one state variable in my mind, which is instantaneous variance. Okay. And um, so not two, like you have in your model. Then you and, can use uh, Ross recovery because variance is stationary, and you're done. Exactly. And uh, so and so one could empirically, you know, test that one factor, Ross recovery of the variance risk premium. Yes, right? you could. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you but if. Interest rates then would be a function of variance since you say you have a one factor model. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. And if interest rates are constant or close to constant, then you're not going to get a uh, large risk premium. Yeah. I so agree. I, I agree you could do with what, what you want to do, but mm -hmm. I don't think it would work well empirically because okay. the premium is large. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so uh, I, I think I'm running out of time here. <clears throat> so let me uh, tell you something that I didn't appreciate for a while, but um, there's an excess return strategy. You can buy the three month VIX and sell, successfully sell three one month VIX portfolios. So when I say VIX portfolio, the, the price of that portfolio is VIX squared. And there's a whole literature called the expectations hypothesis where you regress future variance on past variance. <clears throat> and um, this is actually an excess return strategy. Uh, you can buy a three month variant swap and sell success of one month variant swaps, or you, you can actually buy an underlying option portfolio and implement this strategy. And it's a costless strategy or an excess return. So um, <clears throat> and people have rejected the expectations hypothesis and this is equivalent to saying that there's a conditional or predictable component to the return on variance, to the return on option portfolios. Okay. 
<clears throat> so I want, let me skip to the, uh, we've only got about five minutes here. Um, <clears throat> all right, so in the model, I've graphed the trade-off between the equity premium and the variance premium. Recall my 93 model had two parameters, equity premium and variance premium, and this model predicts that there's only one. Uh, one parameter, you have to lie somewhere on this curve. So there's a testable implication. Basically, the variance premium should be negative, and the equity premium should be positive and lie somewhere on this curve. And this curve is drawn based on options data uh, or parameters, variances, and covariances that you can observe very accurately. Okay, I'm trying to understand that. So uh, let's say up to now I've been thinking you needed to know gamma and psi, I think you called it. Yeah, well, hang on, Peter. Numbers. Can I go over by a few minutes? I don't want people yeah, to- Yeah, you can. Up. Okay, well, thank you. <clears throat> well, um, let me scroll up to what psi is. Um, it satisfies a complicated quadratic equation. <laughs> It's oh. in the paper, but it's not illuminating, but it satisfies a, an equation as a function of gamma and all the other risk neutral parameters. So in fact, size is not an independent parameter in general, it's a function of gamma. Oh, okay. So what I have succeeded in doing in this simple example is reducing the risk premium from two risk premium to only one parameter. If you turn it around, like I know you were saying, a long run, a long maturity, very long maturity option portfolio, would determine psi. And now you're telling me that, let's say psi and gamma are linked. So yep. that tells me that, well, there might be two values of gamma, unfortunately, but anyway, you might be, you know. Uh, there's two values. Well, gamma, you have to tell me, but given gamma, there's a unique value of psi. But can't I work it backwards? Given psi, how many values of gamma are there? Oh, um, yes. Um, so this, this graph I have is actually a giant ellipse. There mm -hmm. would be two values, but- yeah. um, But only one is say physically acceptable or something, right? Like, uh, if, like if we- you want, like, the, you want the real world to be mean reverting and not explosive. Okay. So that's going to give you a unique value of, of the variance premium given the equity premium. I haven't thought about the other direction. Yeah, you should. I know, okay, I will. I will. Yeah, okay. I, right. Actually, I did think about it and took it out of the paper because it was a very messy formula. Huh. But I, I think it's unique. And I, I will have to double check that. But, okay. but there, is, there is a trade-off. I don't have two separate parameters now. I have only one. Right. Okay. And um, well, what, I, what data am I going to fit? Well, I can run these regressions. I can look at the the return on basically a three-month variant swap that hedges with a sequence of one-month variant swaps. Okay. And I can see if that's predictable. In fact, if you run that re linear regression, you find that um, it has a negative slope coefficient when you reject on the current level of variance, the current squared VIX. So this is well known that long-term option prices, long-term volatility moves too much relative to physical volatility. And that means, right, we know that volatility is very quickly mean reverting. So when variance is high today, like let's say there was a big uh, coronavirus and short-term volatility spiked, <clears throat> you say, well, why should long-term option prices increase? After all, volatility mean reverts, and in six months, volatility will be low again. So why do we see one-year option prices so high? And um, that's just an empirical stylized fact that is a violation of the expectations hypothesis. <clears throat> so what I do is I multiply this, um, this regression by an estimate of, this, of the stochastic discount factor, uh, a crude one fitted from options, and um, I actually I get a number that's statistically indistinguishable from zero. So I'm able to fit the stochastic discount factor, or I could recover it just from the slope coefficient in this expectations regression. And I'm emphasizing this because if I regress returns on a variance of a variance swap on today's the variance, the slope coefficient doesn't depend on the level of returns. So you could demean the data and I could still get my estimates. 
So I'm trying to point out that I I'm going to look at the unconditional equity premium, the, that is the average return on the S&P 500. I'm going to look at the unconditional variance premium, which is a long re return on uh, the option portfolio underlying VIX. But I'm also going to look at the conditional return or the predictability of return on, in this case, the three month option portfolio. <coughs> and um, here are some moments for you. I found over my sample, the equity premium on the S&P 500 is 0.7% or 70 basis points per month. On the VIX option portfolio, it's negative 22% per month. <coughs> I, I, you must realize that the VIX option portfolio is extremely levered. So 22% a month sounds large, but um, if you sold options this year, you lost a multiple of that. And, and similarly, my three month strategy is extremely risky, but it also loses money. So I, I still don't know how to um, pick this gamma parameter, but I could fit it to match the equity premium. So in this first column, I've chosen gamma so that the risk adjusted equity premium is zero. And when I choose that gamma, <clears throat> I look at the T statistics on the mean excess return risk adjusted for variance or three month variance and they are, in, they are statistically insignificant. So that means the same parameter we use to fit equity returns also fits variance returns. But we can turn this around. We can recover gamma from options. So we can say that the correlation between future um, interest, future returns on the risk-free rate and on the three month VIX is uncorrelated with variance today. I'm not saying that the mean on the, um, th of the three month VIX is high or low. I'm just saying it's uncorrelated with information today. Okay. So these are the path independent conditions <clears throat> that allow me to recover my preference parameters. And again, I can do this with demeaned option returns. I'm just saying that option returns risk adjusted should be unpredictable. And if I do that, I get the complete pricing kernel. I can construct it, the whole path in my data and measure the covariance with the S&P 500 and consequently predict the average S&P 500 return. And the answer is the fitted value is 1% per month. So this is the first paper that um, I know or know well that actually recovers the equity premium from options data. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, and it's pretty nice equity premium, right? <laughs> One percent a month. Um, yes, well, not, well, actually, maybe the past few weeks, but not the whole year for sure. <clears throat> hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, for, <clears throat> I didn't want to have a large opaque empirical project. I wanted to use uh, indices that are easy to download. The, the, you can compute returns on the option portfolio underlying VIX and the three month VIX by just downloading data from the CBOE. You don't need individual option quotes. And you can compute returns on these portfolios as well as returns on the S&P 500, <clears throat> then it's, it's pretty reasonable to calibrate um, the pricing kernel for these data. You say that, um, if you say that you match the equity premium, then you see whether you match returns on options, or you can match option returns by saying option returns risk adjusted or unpredictable, in which case you can uh, predict the equity premium. And uh, the model is able to jointly predict the equity premium, number one, the average variance premium, number two, and the violations of the expectations hypothesis, which is to say the predictability of the variance premium. So it's able to predict all three of these things with just one parameter. And um, uh, yeah, I guess um, you're getting a numerical value for gamma as well. And um, 
you know, let's say, um, it, I'm guessing it's fairly high. <laughs> since, well, actually, here we are. Yeah, 2.5. 2 okay, yeah. Conversion. Yeah, okay. And okay. Here, the equity premium um, parameter by Mayor and Prescott, of course, they needed risk aversion of 50. Yeah. But they didn't okay. have this extra parameter, xi here, or xi. Uh-huh. Is negative 1.6. So the uh, realize that options have negative betas, but um, equities are also sensitive to variance. Yeah. So you so another thing you, you're implicitly saying is you can lower that sort of paradox. You can reduce that paradox quite substantially by having instantaneous variance as a state variable. Um, because, and you know, that there's, <clears throat> I'd say. Well, let's think about what this parameter would be in the Black-Scholes model. I think the parameter is either the mean divided by the variance or vice versa. So if you think of, yeah, I, I think it's the equity premium divided by the variance. So the, if the equity premium is 8% per year and the variance is 20% squared per year, mu mm -hmm. over stigma squared is four. Okay. So I'm in that ballpark range. Okay, yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. All right, thank you. All okay, right. well, thanks. So, let me, so I do have one summary slide. Okay. I basically generalized recovery theory to growth so I can implement it. Uh, otherwise, it's just hard to figure out how you can uh, estimate a stationary option model on something that grows like the S&P 500. Yeah, so that first bullet point, I now understand what you mean. Because if you go back a slide where you had M, yes. um, which, yeah, then you're saying if you set gamma to zero in this top equation, that's um, getting rid of growth. Is that how you're thinking yep. of it? That's and um, let's say you're, you're, you're thinking that when you set gamma to zero in this top equation, you're now describing after you do that what Ross did. Is, is that how you're thinking? That would be a way to say it, yes. Okay. Okay. And um, if you set gamma to zero, then let's say you're determining psi, because it psi is just a function of gamma and, and the risk neutral parameters. Yes. And um, so um, <clears throat> let's say, okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so if you do, if you, um, allow this extra gamma parameter, you can actually um, implement things in a coherent way. <clears throat> and you actually yeah. get very reasonable predictions. You get an equity premium. Well, of course, you can pick the parameter gamma to fit the equity premium, but you can also fit the average variance premium and the predictability of variance returns. Yeah. So, I mean, well, a test on your model, though, would be to now, for the first time, bring in VIX options data options, notice I said options, and um, let's say see if when you uh, work only with the VIX options data, which you could, you could get the same variance risk premium from the VIX options data as you were getting here on this slide from the S&P 500 options data. Well, I, I don't think so because that would be equivalent to setting gamma equal to zero, right? No, it's not. Oh. No, no, no it's not actually. So, um, you know, so you need to think about that. But uh, with gamma non-zero, I am saying that your model does allow you to not know gamma and determine the variance risk premium if you have VIX options data as data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then if you assume that markets are integrated, not segmented. Yeah. Then the variance premium should be the same in both markets. Right. And you could test that. And, and it comes down to what what do you want to uh, test, right? Some people want to measure returns on international data or currencies or real estate or something else. I wanted to simultaneously match the variance premium and the equity premium. But, um, you know, presumably the variance premium is the same for VIX options as it is for S&P 500 options. Otherwise, some of the people tuning in would be running hedge funds exploiting the difference. Yeah. Okay. Okay, a lot to think about. All right, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, uh, you can reach me at University of Maryland by email. 
Um, I've written down a few comments, but I'm uh, grateful for others. And I will try and um, <laughs> include the comments that uh, I've gotten from, from you, Peter, and Leon, and others. And um, Yeah, so we can open it up to anybody who wants to ask a question or make a comment. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to just unmute yourself. Steve, I have a question. Could you go back, please, to the uh, when you make the statement that m times the mu is a martingale in the um, yes. Let me know. About that page for a second, right? About it's about in the middle of the paper, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, so let me find. Yeah. This. Um, uh, I, I, yes, oh, condition is actually at the beginning. That's it. Bottom of this page, right? So, so, that, that, so that's that's the that's the general. Okay, so I want to understand that. So this M is the change in, is the is the um, kernel basically, right? Change of measure, right? Yes. That, okay, and you take particular functional form for it, Steve. It involves this power of S, right? And this other term. Yes, indeed. Okay, but could you give me the intuition again behind why it's this the product? of u times m, so m, shouldn't m itself be, if it's a change of measure from p to q, shouldn't it its, itself be a martingale in, under p? What am I missing there, you know, like? All right, <clears throat> sure. Well, look, m is your marginal utility. <clears throat> and uh, you say, well, you know, I, I could buy one ice cream cone today, or I, I've got a really lucrative strategy that will double my money, I can buy two ice cream cones tomorrow. But, <clears throat> You know, it, it's it's really hot, and I'm hungry. I really want the ice cream cone today, so that's fine. But <clears throat> there's another security that pays out ice cream cones when I really want them even more than I want them today, and therefore I'll accept a negative return on that security. So that says that the price times the marginal utility um, is a martingale. That okay? So you there is not utility. No. It's price, right? Like let's say price. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So well, that letter U is confusing this context like <laughs> you I, I agree I, I could have used a, a v but v looks like um a variance well, okay so the, but i mean as far as the change of measure likely the process could take you from p to, to q right yes okay that's that, that's what you define and you give a functional form for that right a power yes. of x yes right? i was using n let me find this um well that's that's a specific yeah. parametric form but if i if I go down here, you make, here it, you make it only a function of the end, ending value, not the path, right? Okay. That, is, that is correct. So, right. uh, if, aside from this, um, this power of S, um, M is basically the same as H. Forget about the discount rate and the stock rate, is H. And then we use the reciprocal of M, which is I call N. N is the reciprocal. That thing will be almost a martingale, maybe a martingale with constant drift. And that, that, and that ODE, that solved by N, the reciprocal of H, which is linked to M, brings in both the physical and the risk-neutral parameters. No, there are no um, physical parameters in this ODE. Everything has a star on it. Oh, oh, I'm, oh I'm, okay. Yeah. So with, at this bottom equation, Steve, like, do you, I'm thinking you maybe zero out the coefficient on N in this bottom equation. Is that what you do? What do you mean I zero it out? I mean, I solve the ODE and there's only one value of, um, let me see, given the gamma, there's a unique solution to the ODE that is positive. Oh, oh I'm and sorry, okay, I got, got you. I, I, I see what you So in other words, so since you know the, for the Q parameters, you solve it, that gives you the M and that gives you the change of measure and you can recover the physical parameters. That's right. Gotcha. Right. So, so subject to this one parameter gamma, that's all right. Uh, these are all risk neutral parameters that give me a unique N, which gives me the unique M, which gives me the unique physical measure. Right. What a, amazing. <laughs> yeah. Is it Steve? Yes. Yeah, this, I, this, it's Armand. Hey, Peter, how are you doing? Hi, good. How are you, Armand? Yeah, I, I, how's your, I, I like your background there. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> okay. I was thinking, uh, Steve, I don't know if you, um, um, I'm um, looking at the at the, the paper you had, which is using the data through uh, 2018, right? Yes. I was looking. What do you think would happen with if you view some of the data, let's say from the last two months, with the high spikes 
involved. What do you think um, you would change some of your conclusions if you added some of that, some of that volatility from last uh, month or so? Well, two comments about what would have happened. This now I can speculate, or this is not speculation. This is what I know would have happened is if I had updated it, I would have had no time to do my teaching. Of course. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the what I'm right would have become even more negative. And um, the equity premium would have also have been slightly reduced. I'm not sure about the predictability, but um, let's look at my graph uh, connecting the equity premium and the, and the variance premium. If I scroll down, there's only two graphs and there it is. <clears throat> this says that there's a, a trade-off so that when the equity premium becomes more negative, the equity premium rises. Of course, we know these things are negatively correlated instantaneously. So when, variant, when the market goes down, variance goes up. Um, after variance rose, um, the subsequent market returns were actually quite positive. So I don't know if you want to say that there's a very positive variance premium now um, and a large negative variance premium but uh, that's what the model would say. Right. I mean, I guess you know, if, you, if you look at the way that the, way the, um, the, the, you know, the options traded with the spike, I wonder if, the, wonder if there would be any, you know, given the, given the tails on, on, on the, some, of the, some of the options, how that would, because, you know, I guess if you, if you, if you, if you look at the VIX actual computation, when you look at the tails, I think what happened is um, that it was, you know, the volatility, historical volatility for a while was really deviating from the VIX quite a bit. I think because the tails were coming down quickly. I'm just trying, trying to figure out the, um, the calculation of the VIX. How would it have happened? Because um, I'm, I'm not saying it nothing properly, actually. I got I to gotta think about this. Anyway, I just, I just was looking at, that was it was a very sort of very sort of um, large difference between the realized and the historical vol. It's you know the if you look at the graph of of the last uh, like five weeks. Oh, okay, let me uh, it, yeah. Let me just broadly address uh, your your sentiments. Um, I started this model off with a parametric example. Right, a diffusion model with a square root process. Not because I think the world is really a diffusion or a square root process, but it gives us a simple two-factor model to examine recovery theory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I don't wanna test whether the world is a diffusion or the world is a square root process. In fact, I've published similar multi-factor models with jumps. So I examine the predictions for returns or average returns. Now, uh, there have been some large returns lately, but we know they're not statistically significant. They're very risky. <clears throat> so I can only measure long run returns. And I don't think that the long run returns are terribly sensitive to whether things are diffusion or not. And in fact, I don't think that the long run returns on VIX and three month VIX uh, really depend that heavily on whether there's a one factor or a 10 factor model. Right? I think that we can broadly agree that the variance premium is negative and very, very negative, that the equity premium is modestly positive, mm -hmm. and also that the variance premium is predictable, right? That when variance is high, the variance premium is also high, but, all, but more negative. Right. So I, th I think that all those things would survive um, the data we experienced so far this year and the data we're going to experience in the future. Okay, very good. Yeah. It was a good talk, very, in, very interesting talk. Well, thank you. Yeah. Maybe a little bit of more technical question. Uh, going back to page, I think, seven or where it was on the specific assumptions which you have of the price recovery. Is there any possibility to justify this maybe by a uh, I would say dual Markovian projection argument. So what I'm thinking is, well, we know uh, if we have just a general diffusion model, we know all this exists, a one-dimensional diffusion model, 
such that all the one-dimensional marginals are the same or speaking in finance terms. Whatever the real market dynamics are, we know always it exists a local volatility model. So it's a European option price. We don't know anything about other option prices that depend on the path of the European prices. If we can find such a model. Similar, if I have a stochastic volatility model, I know whatever the reality is, I can build up a stochastic volatility model such that all prices on European options and all prices on uh, cumulated variance agree with what they are in reality, but not for path dependent options. You see a similar argument. Well, the pricing kernel is, is just the dual element, the dual diffusion to the, to the price and volatility process. So can we somehow justify this form of the pricing kernel to be somehow a Markovian projection, which is not the reality, but which mimics reality to a certain degree, such that some parameters are the same as in reality? Uh, well, I think if you talk to Bob Gero, he would say, no, there are infinite number of pricing kernels that can fit European options. And whatever I give you, unless it makes markets perfectly complete, um, I'm going to have multiple M's. So if you want to work in, it, it, um, let's see, uh, if you want to work with the securities we have, there's some ambiguity. Yeah, so what I think what Stefan is saying is that instead of, you know, Starting from the bivariate diffusion that you did start from, you could instead start from a, um, let's say, a setting with more than two Brownian motions in it and um, think of uh, the, um, the, the ODE on the bottom of this slide as, um, let's say, the result of what's called Markovian projection onto now two state variables S and V. And, um, and like as far as all you can learn from option prices, um, there's really no difference between the more general starting point, which was non-Markovian, uh, and this and the Markovian starting point you had in this paper. Is that fair, Stefan, how you're thinking? Yes, it's fair for the forward process. My question was, can we apply something else or something on the dual perspective, meaning on the pricing curve? Is there some uh -huh. similar projection argument behind of the dual side? Basically a dual projection speaking not about the forward path, meaning the price and volatility processes, but on the dual path, which is the pricing curve. Should be. <laughs> That's uh, a duality. Well, well, okay. The first part I enthusiastically support saying, all right, maybe the world has 10 factors, but they're too complicated and we don't have enough data to separately estimate them. So we're going to project it onto two factors, sort of like principal components. And if this is a reasonable approximation, which I think it is, then the option prices and risk premium we get should also be a reasonable approximation. Yeah. But I think you can say that all models are approximate, but the approximations are pretty good and that the error is continuous in the accuracy of that approximation. But now you're saying, well, does that mean that my pricing kernel is good? And um, well, the answer is that in principle, this eta might be non-zero. So you, you can come up with multiple pricing kernels and because we don't have perfect spanning in my setup. By design, the idea is that the world has more factors than we have securities. <clears throat> and if you choose a complicated pricing kernel, um, right, it would be different from mine. And there are lots of these complicated pricing kernels. So how do we make a prediction or how do we choose? And I'm, I'm really just going to have to plead mercy and offer a pragmatic solution, choose the simplest. So it's a little bit like Occam's razor, say, if you don't have a problem with the square root process, you know, a one factor approximation of the volatility surface, then you shouldn't have a big problem with the pricing kernel depending on that one factor. And so mm -hmm. this is a, a more an argument of parsimony and pragmatism 
Um, you can also go to the um, Epstein-Zinn preferences, which basically gives you the same functional form here. Mm -hmm. but, but underlying this is a restriction on preferences. You know, I can give somebody just literally path-dependent preferences exogenously. And for this agent, they, they don't just care about whether volatility is high or low. They care about what happened in between, right? They don't want you to tell them the ending of the movie before the end of the movie. That spoils the whole movie for them. They say, why? Why can't you just pretend that, you, that I didn't tell you, right, that the, uh, the hero dies in the end? <laughs> and they say, well, I can't forget that knowledge. So you can create rational maximizing agents with weird preferences, but I'm saying that um, those probably wouldn't have profoundly different predictions for option values than the ones I give, and the ones I give are simpler, and they're unique, and they're not um, specified with reference to a specific model. Um, just uh, let's take the alternatives, Stefan. Um, Sometimes people say there's a three-factor model with jumps, and you have up jumps and down jumps. So I'm giving, going to give separate risk premium for the up jumps and for the down jumps. And then you have someone like Engel come up with a Garch model, and he's got risk premium in his model, and you can't really compare those risk premia from one model with the risk premium in another. And it's over-parameterized, and I've got a way that's consistent across models. I say whatever your state space is, it's a function of the state space times a power. And all I need is this one power parameter. So um, the question is whether these predictions are reasonable, and so far they are. Well, maybe a last thing. I, I, I think I don't want to argue at all about this. What I want to do is I want to ask, is there an additional reasonable reason for this form besides parsimonicity. You can argue for a local volatility model purely by saying it's a parsimonious model, it's a simple diffusion model, what I can write down basically. Okay. Or I could take Bruno Dupier's approach and say, well, the good thing about it is, well, if I have just uh, the whole uh, option surface, then I can perfectly calibrate this model since I have to pierce one. The question is, do we have a kind of Dupier formula rational, not on the price side, but on the kernel side? Additional strengthening the argument besides parsimonicity. Besides what, please? As an additional argument besides parsimonicity. Not uh, only saying it's parsimonious, this is one argument, but is there also an argument Coming, coming from a perspective like the PS formula, but on the, on the dual side and not on the, on the primary side. I, I, I don't know, it's an open question for me. Yes, I don't know those formulas. Now, I know Dupier's work, and he's able to recover local volatility, but I don't think he has um, extra predictions for the physical measure. So, so he tended to work directly in the risk neutral measure, and I don't think he could tell you what these risk premia are. Yeah. So the, the point is that we need some new principle to do valuation, some principle that goes beyond option prices, but actually dire um, directly addresses preferences. And this is a principle that, um, you know, well, I had some early work, but Ross wrote the recovery paper. And this is a principle that transcends models so it works not only in diffusion models, but also in jump models. Yeah, so and the principle, let's because that is the important takeaway, is, is yeah. that, let's say, is transition or path independence, whatever you want to call it, identifies uh, at least one risk premium. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so the transition independence, um, yes, that pins down almost everything. Well, here, like it, it's a, it didn't pin down gamma. Yeah, almost. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it did pin down, let's say, the other one, which I think you called psi. Psi, yes. Um, let's say, given gamma. And so, so, that, so that's the principle. I know you're saying it goes way beyond this particular example, but yes. let's just, for the, you know, to avoid, to make it clear, just, you know, I'm not saying, so just for this example, just to make it clear, the principle is, 
transition independence pins down at least, I would say, at least one risk premium, right? Like, so it depends yeah. down psi given gamma. That, so, that is correct. Okay. And of course, I, I, I took a model with only two risk premia, so if I give you one, it tells you the other one. But uh, if you have 10 risk premia, 10 factors, um, then if I give you the equity premium, you get the other nine. And if I give you a whole distribution of jumps, then if oh. you have the equity premium, it gives you the whole distribution of jumps in the physical measure based on the distribution in the risk neutral measure. Yeah, so it's, okay, so in the models beyond this one, you're saying it's still only one condition called transition independence, yeah. but you're learning, let's say, all but one thing in those other models. That's that right. right. Yeah. yeah. And that oh, one okay. thing is like the mean in the Black-Scholes model. Yeah. And the reason, let's say, we don't learn that mean in the Black-Scholes model is why. Uh, why? Um, the standard reason we don't learn it. Okay, I, okay. Um, because, let's say, is it because that's a non-stationary? Yes, that one, one dimension of non-stationarity mm -hmm. allows um, multiple things to happen at infinity or multiple gammas here. So you can stick in different gammas and get different equity premia. Yeah. Like mathematically, um, what's causing inability to learn gamma is um, that, um, let's say, the eigenvalue problem you have at the bottom, because that is an eigenvalue problem. Like, I'm thinking yes. um, that um, if you think of gammas, let's see. Um, hmm, okay. Um, I'm, well, I want to call gamma the eigenvalue. I don't know if I can. <laughs> um, but maybe it's a function of gamma. That's the eigenvalue. A quadratic function of gamma is the eigenvalue. And then, um, yeah, indeed, say, it's in this um, ODE where I forgot a bracket. Yeah. All the stuff that's inside the brackets is the eigenvalue. Yeah, let's call it that. Okay, I agree. And um, let's say, so the, let's say the, the issue is that there's associated to n the positive eigenfunction, there's, oh, there's not just one positive eigenfunction, actually. I mean, if you, if you let gamma be free, if you don't say that you know gamma, okay, so if you're letting, if you're simultaneously trying to solve this problem for both gamma and n, all right, yes. then I'm thinking there's multiple positive solutions. Okay, and then if you fix a gamma v value, then there's only one, which is what you said. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Okay. Let, let me answer your question in a more intuitive way. Suppose mm -hmm. we take the, the raw stationary framework, stationary bounded <laughs> finite framework. Yeah. And say what proportion of the stock's value comes from really large movements or really small movements? And the answer is zero because the stock price is bounded. But um, in this non-stationary model, right, uh, depending on gamma, a larger or smaller uh, proportion of value comes from the tails of the stock price. And since the stock price can get infinitely large or arbitrarily large, that, be, that maintains a non-negligible portion of the value. Okay. So that, that is the one thing you need to pin down before you can value everything else. Okay. Okay, yeah. It's interesting. It's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> uh, so, um, <clears throat> so we could actually take the view that, let's say in your model that, you know, gamma as a parameter is not a parameter. It's actually, let's say, um moving through time and um that you know everything is let's say being driven off where this gamma is like so you know so i'm thinking um i know formally you've got gamma constant but I, i'm thinking like probably if you were to look try to estimate gamma over different time periods you would probably get different values for gamma do you think so 
Well, I, what you're saying is equivalent to saying, does the equity premium change through time? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, you could say that, but look, we're in the business of saying that some things are is constant over our data sets and other mm -hmm. things change and predicting how they change. So, uh, you know, I think volatility changes a lot and I think the level of the market changes a lot. In fact, I think they will both change tomorrow and the next day. And uh, by the time we collect enough data to measure um, gamma or the equity premium, <laughs> yeah, it, it might change a little bit, but um, yeah. it takes so long to collect data to measure it, we might as well assume it's constant. Okay. So I like your, t I like your model though, because let's say, it, I think it, 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 you know, it, it sort of presents a view of the big picture, which is that you can't recover everything. You know, you can recover some things and not others, like basically, you know, so, so I think that's probably realistic. And um, so, um, you know, so that means like, you know, people who are sort of against what Ross did, what they're really rejecting is the idea that you can recover everything. I don't think they want to say you can't recover anything. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so you're kind of making clear what you can and cannot recover here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, again, Ross was a very intuitive thinker. So it's a little bit um, surprising that his uh, economic justification was communicated as uh, the, the uh, Frobenius Perone theorem says this is the answer. I say, well, but, but why is that relevant? And the answer had to do with time separable utility or time separable marginal utility. And uh, there's a similar intuition here that again, you depend on where you end up, but not how you got there. And if you're willing to assume that, then you do uh, uniquely identify or almost up to gamma, identify the pricing kernel out of all the possible ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good place to end. All right. Thanks a lot, Steve. We, oh, okay. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you, Leon and Stefan and everyone for your comments. Okay. Very good. You can reach right. me in Maryland and uh, we'll all be in touch. Definitely. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, Bye everybody. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.